Great. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first attempt, obviously, thanks for the invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure to, um, to speak here and, and give you some outline on, on basics. So this is all about basics. And thanks for the uh, introductional talk on indications, because indications is actually all about awareness. So you cannot treat patients unless you see that. So uh, you need awareness of the, of the problem. So deformity analysis is key. And how to do analysis and uh, how to do basic planning, um, well, these are now uh, uh, the topics for the next lectures. And then we will dive in deeper and deeper. And obviously, tomorrow there is another se uh, session. So this is not about uh, technical issues and the true very uh, deep parts of, uh, of modern sophisticated technical osteotomy. So you will see that in live surgery tomorrow and you will see that obviously in live surgery today and you will see that or hear about it in the next uh, coming lectures. So, planning in osteotomy. Well, that is my first lecture now and obviously that seems uh, not too appealing, uh, like the boring part. So, you just, I mean, we're surgeons, we want to do surgery, so why should I plan? Um, actually, you should plan because that is like 60% of your surgery. And, and it breaks down uh, um, the complexity of your surgery once you're in the OR. So if you look at the really great guys, they still go and have hand-drawn images and stick them to the walls in their, in their theaters because it's easier if you follow a plan. So um, I like this quote uh, that Matt is always bringing. Um, who, who, plan, or who fails to plan, uh, plans to fail. Actually, uh, that's what it's all about. So you should do planning. So now let's go into it. Disclosures, um, conflict of interest. I have none related to this topic, obviously, because it's pure, purely planning here. Um, we've spoken about uh, X-ray assessment. So what we need is a long leg standing film. And um, yeah, long leg standing films seem to be easy, but obviously you can make quite some errors there. So the orientation, as we were hearing already, is uh, very important. Well, this one is not what uh, it should be like, and it played different. Where, give me one second, I need to fix that, because then I played this one with, um, with PowerPoint, and Keynote wasn't getting it right, but it did in the other one, so I will be there in a second. But it's, um, it's an important slide, so therefore we just jump there. So this is the slide, actually. Um, which was slightly distorted. So, um, but you can see what the orientation of the long leg standing film alone makes of a difference. So that's the same patient coming back from the uh, assessment with this image. Obviously, nothing to plan on because it was completely mal-oriented. So, send the patient back, coming back with another x-ray, giving you a completely different limb shape. So it looks like being operated already, but it was just the rotational profile. So it's very important to get it right. So what is now an AP-oriented standing film? It's basically not just the patella to the front, because that's the most mobile bone at the, at the lower limb. It's also one-third coverage of the fibula head, and the condyles should point at you straight and not curved. Okay, so that is actually an AP image. So now, for the assessment of, um, of uh, the, whole, um, the whole anatomy, we need to follow a certain nomenclature. And this nomenclature is there for years, but it's, um, it's been redefined, and the, the best version actually is based on Dropedi's work, so we all refer to that here. And the first thing we do is we define joint centers. So the center of uh, the proximal part of the femur, obviously, um, it's easy to assess, it's a spherical structure in the two-dimensional x-ray, it's, it's, it's a circle and finding the center of a circle is easy. So let's say we find the center of the circle, that's the proximal joint center of the femur. There's also a distal joint center of the femur and that is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, what is the middle actually in an AP image? Well, there is plenty of opportunities. You could even take the skin mantle to uh, defy. You can take the... Uh, the, um, the um, the notch itself or the roof of the notch, you could take the outer margin of the epicondyles. There is plenty of assessments, just stick to one. The major point here is that you see all these blue dots actually aligned somewhere in the middle, regardless whatever uh, uh, typology you choose. 
So you just need to stick to that and then you come to the center. So I personally, in an AP image, take the, the, uh, the roof uh, uh, of the notch. That's my point. Okay. So for the proximal uh, joint center of the tibia, well, I use the part in between the two spines. Okay. And then for the distal joint center, I take the center of the talus, as you can see here. So likewise, plenty of assessments, center of talus is absolutely fine. So, what you've seen now is that there are four joint centers, meaning we are assessing both bones individually. So the femur and the tibia get their own assessments. It's one limb, but we look at both long bones, okay? So, having that, now we define joint lines. So what is a joint line? Well, the joint line is the orientation of the knee bases, actually. And for the femur, that's the connection of the most distal points uh, of, the, of the condyles, you see here. And for the tibia is the connection of the subchondral sclerosis, and that is being seen here. So we have now joint centers and we have joint lines, okay, nomenclature. Fairly easy, but very important. So you need to learn that, and that is your roadmap. You follow that in every of these x-rays. You draw your joint centers, you draw your joint lines, and the next thing we do is we draw axes. So uh, when it comes to axes, it's slightly uh, confusing because there is anatomical axes, and that is actually the orientation of the shaft. If you have a kink within the shaft, you may have two axes. So this is where this CORA, center of rotation of angulation concept, comes from. But the closer we come to the joint, so in osteotomy is about the knee, we don't follow this CORA concept because it's, it's kind of hyper-complicated by the anatomy itself. So you cannot cause, uh, or you cannot follow the CORA concept fully the closer you come to the joint because you cannot virtually cut everywhere where you want. You need to follow anatomy. So what we do here is Obviously, we leave that concept a little bit and we look at the axes, not at the anatomical axes, but at the mechanical axes. Because what we change in osteotomy is mechanics. It's all about mechanics. So, and the mechanical axes is very simply now the connection of the previously defined joint centers. So you just connect the centers of the femur, proximal and distally, and the centers of the tibia, proximal and distally. That's it. So now why is it important that there is mechanical and anatomical axes? Well, at the tibial side, it's not important at all because they are mostly parallel. But at the femur, we have a, a different anatomy because we have a femoral neck. And so that is the difference between the mechanical and the anatomical axes uh, of, of the femur. And th that varies, obviously, but it's roughly six, seven degrees. And this is what we all know when we do joint replacements and we put our jigs to like five, six, seven degrees whatsoever, aiming for 90 then, probably we should set them to eight, nine, 10 to, to aim for 88 because that is what nature gives us for, uh, for the, uh, the angular values, but we will come to those values in a bit. So we have now axes, we have joint lines, and we have joint centers. So this is the overall mechanical axis of the lower limb, and we ha heard already that it's called Mikulic line or weight-bearing line in the American uh, um, uh, literature, where it's not really weight-bearing because that comes from the center of the pelvis, but that passes the knee somewhere close to the midpoint. But what now is important is, if you take the individual axes or, or axes of the femur and the tibia, and you take the joint lines that we defied, well, in between the joint line and the individual axis of femur and tibia, there is an angle. And this is called LDFA for the femur and MPTA for the tibia. So it's the lateral distal femur angle by definition that we look at, and it's the medial proximal tibia angle by definition that we look at. And that tells us that overall in relation to the Mikulic line, the joint line of the knee is inclined by two degrees to the medial side, okay? It's very important, but it's not really important that you remember all these angular values. You don't have to remember that because you just remember that the limb is straight and the knee joint line inclines by two degrees to the medial side. Then automatically you come to 88 and 88. And the only reason why 
Puristically, you can say MPTA without a little M in the front um, at the tibia, and you have to say MLDFA for the femur with a little M in the front, is because you need to specify at the femoral side um, whereas is mechanical or anatomical, because there is a difference. At the tibial side, you can forget about it because they are parallel, is the same, okay? So that's the nomenclature, very important. So we have individual assessments for the femur and the tibia because we know that they may be uh, out of range, and so obviously we correct our anatomy at the point which is an outlier. We don't correct where the anatomy is correct, okay? So you need to assess the femur and the tibia because it may be in, in one of them, in both of them, um, and you don't know before you analyze. So you need to have a proper analysis of the malalignment in order to find your, your uh, origin of malalignment and your point of correction. It could equally, as Matt pointed out, at a third uh, level of deformity, which is inside of the joint, which probably is not a great indication for an osteotomy. So once again, because it's important, MLDFA, 88, 87, uh, ranging around that by two degrees. Same for the MPTA, 87, ranging around that by two degrees, plus and minus, that is normal values, okay? So now how, we, how do we plan an osteotomy now? So the first thing is we detect our Mikulic line because this is the overall situation that we have. So status quo, so that is where we are. So then we want to correct our patient. So we need a virtual Mikulic line. And we draw that virtual Mikulic line from our proximal joint center of the femur, obviously, because from there on everything starts. That gives you your alignment. So it shall intersect where you want to put it. And we've heard already previously we came from like almost 70% intersection point of the tibial plateau width, and we came rather back now to 55 put it somewhere to valgus, mostly the lateral spine. Tip of the lateral spine is a good orientation marker, okay? These overcorrections that we've seen in the past were rather palliative surgeries when we did not respect the joint line orientation. So the, fe the fewer you respect the joint line orientation, the further you bring the weight to the contralateral side. But what we do today is we try to restore normal anatomy, and this is why uh, joint line orientation plus Mikulic line is of importance. So then you define the hinge point because this is where all the action starts. So now it's very complex um, because you, you change your perspective from on-site view onto that plane radiograph to the hinge point because this is where it all happens. Usually uh, colleagues are getting confused with where to draw my next lines. Well, change your perspective and become the hinge yourself. You are the hinge now. And you look at where your ankle joint is right now, and then you rotate your neck and look at where you want to be in a bit. And this rotation of your neck, actually, is your angular correction of the osteotomy. Become the hinge, okay? You are the center of the osteotomy. Of course, you do it. So doing this now, you have another line, which is called line A, uh, which shall be black here, but it's white, so you cannot see it. I'm really sorry for that. And a line B, but um, it's, it's, not like, it's not the right color. So this is why I have to come here. So line A actually, line A actually um, goes from the center of the ankle joint to the hinge, and line B goes from the hinge to uh, the center of the ankle joint where it's about to be after the surgery, so your prospective ankle joint position. So as I said, and this is the, the axis of change of, of neck rotation, okay? So this angle A that you describe with this change actually is your osteotomy correction, okay? This osteotomy correction now has to be somewhat translated from angles into metrics because angles are tough to measure during surgeries. So you need metrics, that's easy, okay? And if you want to kind of translate that, you need to just take the same angle and draw it to the medial cortex. And from there on, you have the same angle. You, on a calibrated X-ray, and this is why we calibrate them, you can measure the height of the cortex, okay? And yet then you come mostly, or roughly, it's, it's like one degree goes for a millimeter, but it could be different. So we've kind of abandoned this typology where we just say m millimeter goes for, an, uh, for a degree. 
That, that doesn't work, it's not precise enough, okay? So, and this wedge base height then can be measured. Same for the, uh, for the distal femoral side, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the DFOs, but actually the other way around. So here you start at the ankle joint, and um, well, we can skip that. This is technical. We, uh, uh, for the sake of, of time, I guess we skip that. We just go into that here. So uh, we start at the ankle joint, go to the center of the, um, of the uh, proximal femur, Mikul draw a Mikulic line, virtual Mikulic line, once again defy our hinge point. So we once again become the hinge. We've seen that already. Um, maybe we can jump in here a little further because that speeds it up. As you can see, this is the change that you describe. Okay, this is very intuitive. Once you become the hinge and place yourself there, you can just rotate it and see it. Okay, so this is what you do. And then you type in figures and you say, well, eight is too much, seven is just about right. That's what we do, okay? We bring our, our, uh, our actual an anatomical point to the virtual point. That's it. So, and that all goes just around the hinge. Here we have them in black. I don't know why that is the case now, but here it becomes now clear. So line A, line B, the angle in between is the change of the osteotomy. Transfer that to the cortex, measure the height, get your osteotomy. So if you want to know more about that, obviously um, we welcome you. Um, easy for you probably to come to London. Uh, there is a great center that uh, Prof. Wilson set up, the London Osteotomy Center, and we uh, work in the London Clinic, have our own hospital in Harley Street, so just ask us, and if you want to visit us, see some osteotomies, learn more about planning, then um, just feel free to contact us, and um, now we come to the take-home mantra. So check for a proper x-ray. We have seen that orientation is key. If you don't do that, you are not on the right track. Um, develop an analytic approach always do it like this. Just check your x-ray, joint centers, joint lines, axes, angles, and then do you do your, your planning, okay? It's very simple, but you have to follow that. Analysis comes first. You need to have an analysis of the malalignment because when you plan, you plan to uh, do some certain surgery, a DFO, an HTO, an, I don't know, uh, a shaft correction, whatever. But you need, when you start to plan, have your analysis. Because you may plan an HTO in a patient who has a distal femoral uh, deformity. So analyze your deformity, then you know where to correct, and then you plan. Focus on the hinge point, become the hinge yourself. It's way easier to change your perspective. Circulate the correction around the hinge, we've seen that. That's the only part where action occurs. It's the hinge. So this is why the hinge is so important. Translate angles to metrics, we have seen that already, and that was it about. Thank you.